Crane Britain's Anatomy of Revolution was a study of how revolutions occurred. The author, Britain, wrote the book as a way to study the different revolutions that he saw occurring in the world around them, particularly the French Revolution. We'll use his criteria to study revolutions throughout the semester. The basic premise of Britain's theory was that the fever was a metaphor for complexities in society that were causing problems. If you view society as a human body, you can think of revolutions as a fever. The higher the fever, the more danger it presents to the body. To best understand the metaphor of the fever, we first have to look at what it is that people want from their government, what might cause them to complain, and of course, how people feel about change in a larger scheme. There are basic things that people want from any government that they have. The first would be safety, the idea that they can operate and go along in their daily lives without concern for their personal well-being. Justice, some sort of equality with society. Their rights to opportunity, that they will be given a chance to succeed as long as they put in hard work. And that there is some potential for success, that if they do that work, they can improve this lot in life. When any of these four are taken away, people typically become angered with their governments in particular and society in general. This, uh, the converse is also true. When people have these needs met, they tend to let things slide. The idea that fat, happy people don't start revolutions works really well here. What this means for our discussion is that there are going to be complaints in society. Complaints arise when the needs of the people aren't met, or they perceive that the government isn't doing all it can to meet people's needs. Taxes are a great example. Most people are happy to pay taxes when they receive some sort of service from the government. When they feel that those monies are being applied elsewhere, say, for instance, someone was embezzling the entire tax fund and putting it into a Swiss bank account, that typically angers people. And now a word about change. Quite frankly, if our lives were changeless and human society didn't make improvements, well, they would all probably still be gathering twigs and berries for our main sustenance, and that just doesn't sound like much fun. That's not to say that people like change. In fact, it's often been said that the American people want change to happen. They just want it to be slow and unnoticed. This great quote that the Joker has during the Dark Knight, which I provided below. If you have any time whatsoever, it's worth reading or at the very least viewing the movie. Ah, but I digress. Back to change. The basics are that people don't like things to change because it messes with their plans. If you plan on retiring at age 65, but suddenly the government doesn't let you collect Social Security, you would typically become rather aggravated with that sort of thing. Big change freaks people out. Like if maybe the dining hall were to say, we're going to be vegetarian until the end of the year. People freak out. So, if a society suddenly has new things going on that change the relationship between the government and the people, that tends to aggravate people a great deal. All of this talk about expectations and change leads us to Crane Britain's stages of revolution. He says that when those changes build up, or when those complaints build up to a point where people really decide they need to take action, revolution occurs. And he says there's four stages. And let's face it, he's not very creative with the titles. The initial stage is called the preliminary stage. Second, the first stage. I know you'd think this would come first, but, well, it's his idea, so he gets to name what he wants. Then there's the crisis stage. I bet none of you can guess what happens then. And of course the recovery stage. And holy cow, it takes forever to get from one to the other. A preliminary stage can be years long. And goodness knows that the crisis in first stage can last as long as well. Britain had a really specific timeline when he wrote this because, well, he's a French Revolution historian and it sees a lot of these criteria there. It doesn't mean that every stage happens in every revolution. It's just a helpful framework for us. The preliminary stage are all the stuff that happens before revolution can really get started. If you were thinking of it like an athletic program, it's like preseason practices. I'd like you to note in the presentation, at least the PowerPoint, that all the different parts of revolution, so the different sections of a preliminary stage, they're all in caps. So if you're looking for the different parts, they're capitalized for you. And when you go back to look at it, it'll help you follow along. Okay, so Britain says the first thing that happens before any revolution goes down is that the different parts of society stop getting along. The lower class and the middle class might be angered because, while well, the ruling party shows favoritism to one or the other. Actually, it's usually the upper class that gets that favoritism, but, you know, that's a different story. 
that tension between different groups of people from different socio-economic classes is called class antagonism, and it's the first sign that a revolution's on the horizon. Next up is government inefficiency. This basically says that the government, though it's doing the same things that it has always done, can't seem to solve enough of the problems and complaints start rising amongst the people. For instance, if a government has enforced the same tax policy for 100 years, but that suddenly isn't paying the bills because they've expanded the programs that they're paying for, that's government inefficiency. They're less efficient, they're not as good at doing what they've always done, and that tends to make people mad because they feel their money's wasted. 